So in this lecture, we're going to talk not so much about a material, uh, but about a process. And prefabrication is something that we've talked about before. Uh, we've certainly looked at examples where elements of a building are fabricated or manufactured off-site and, and brought to the, to the job site. But today we're going to look at how prefabrication really ramps up uh, in the post-war era especially and how it offers kind of new opportunities for putting together sort of new availability of industrial capacity with new problems that society faces, especially uh, after, after World War II. In general, when we're talking about prefabrication, we're talking about work that's done offsite. And usually we save the word to mean something that's done under factory conditions. So in a controlled environment where the weather isn't a problem, where you have easy access to whatever you're working on and where you can, as a result, get much better results. Uh, more precise work comes out of it, more consistent work comes out of it. You can, of course, throw something away if it's done wrong, whereas on site that's often uh, quite difficult. This also provides real scheduling advantages. You can be manufacturing the components of a building while you're digging the foundations for the building. And this allows contractors to telescope the, the construction schedule to save time, which of course saves money, but also to sort of put the, the labor uh, where it's, it's most efficient. So in factory work, very often uh, prefabrication relies on mass production. So just like in the Henry Ford assembly line, the same tasks being done repetitively over and over again. That often means that less skilled and therefore less expensive labor can be used to, to produce much of the work. Likewise, on the job site, instead of relying on what we call wet construction, skilled workers like bricklayers, uh, we can rely more on uh, unskilled labor to actually just assemble the pieces that are getting made uh, in the factory. So there are a lot of advantages to thinking about this, to thinking about sort of splitting the, the construction of a building into a couple parts, right? One that's done mostly in the factory to very high tolerances, the other that's done on site very often quickly sort of bolting things together uh, instead of crafting something in conditions that might not be ideal. <clears throat> We've seen this most directly probably in the Crystal Palace, right? This is often thought of as the first prefabricated building. Because so much of it is made off site and brought to Hyde Park where it's simply assembled, and there are variants in this, right? You may remember that a lot of the wood sashes for the glass is manufactured, but it's manufactured on site, right? The carpentry is done <clears throat> with lathes and things that are adjacent to the construction site. And that still counts. That's still doing things off site in the sense that you're not up on a, a, a scaffold 30 feet in the air trying to shape a, a, a window sash you're shaping the window sash in controlled conditions and then putting it on the job site in a way that just allows you to sort of uh, bolt it together, nail it together. Crystal Palace, you may remember, was under incredible time constraints. And so being able to manufacture the glass and the cast iron, for instance, at the same time, uh, means that, the, that, that Paxton is able to telescope the construction scheduling uh, and build it on time. In the post-war era, this idea really picks up because of two things. One is there is a, a massive industrial buildup. There's a lot of surplus industrial capacity. Factories have been built, particularly in America, to produce uh, wartime material. And that those factories, the people who work in those factories, there's a, a desire to kind of keep the flywheel going, right? To keep the, the, the pace of that going, to keep employment up to find ways basically to use the, the production that's coming out of the factories to, to different ends. At the same time, there's this huge demographic boom where returning soldiers in particular start families. Uh, there's a, 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 a rise in the birth rate, both in America and, and in Europe. This puts pressure on construction to build houses and housing, uh, especially in the 1950s. But it also in particular produces pr pressure to build schools, right? There are many, many more children being born in the post-war era. They've got to go to school somewhere. The existing kind of uh, 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 number of schools isn't nearly enough uh, to handle the, the, the rise in, in demography that's happening during the 50s. There are also things that, that sort of ease the, 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 the mix of 
industrial capacity and, and societal needs. There are new materials, many of which have been perfected or improved during the war to allow them to be produced uh, using uh, mass repetition techniques. Um, there are new kind of typologies. We'll talk much more about curtain walls when we look at skyscrapers, but this is one of the ways in which uh, a formerly difficult task in closing a building gets made much, much <clears throat> easier uh, through prefabrication. If you can produce all of the elements of, of your uh, exterior wall in a factory and just simply bolt them onto your building, you're saving all the time of laying uh, brickwork and things like that that the traditional building implies. New materials, <clears throat> or sorry, old materials, but used in new ways like precast concrete, uh, allow for prefabrication to sort of disseminate uh, into other areas of the of the building uh, industry. And then finally, this idea that we've seen a little bit when we talked about scientific management uh, in construction in the 20s and 30s, the idea that, that you can use, that you can build using systems that more and more you can pick things out of a catalog, specify them instead of sort of designing them. And that saves both the kind of intellectual labor and cost of design but it also means that, that you can use uh, a handful of techniques, standardization, modularization, uh, to ensure that, that your building is gonna be constructible. In the early 1950s, there's a lot of thought, especially in Great Britain, about making this match, about matching industrial production to the, the, the needs of society. Uh, in 1951, Great Britain is just seeing the kind of first effects of the post-war uh, uh, dem demographic boom with lots of new families, lots of young children, uh, and also at the same time depleted housing stock because of the, the, the effects of war. A.C. Bossom, who is a, a, an engineer, who's one of the, the people that the, the British government sets to the task of trying to figure out uh, how to make this match, comes up with this sort of manifesto for prefabrication, uh, where he says that, look, the, the advantage here is that you're turning out buildings using mass production, right? You're, you're making them by the mile, using them by the yard. And what he means is that you can just sort of set the production line up and have it go and have all the stuff that you need to make a building sitting in the warehouse, right? Ready to go on site uh, at a moment's notice. If you put more of your effort into prefabrication, then he says you're doing the work in the shops and not in the, the kind of fickle English weather, right? You're, you're not having to stop production of, of the, of the uh, material uh, for rainy days or snowy days. And he says, because you're doing it in the shop, you can use machinery that otherwise couldn't be left out in the rain. You can make things very precise. You can basically treat buildings like machines. You can get to a level of precision and tolerance that allows you to get, he says, perfect lighting, heating, ventilation, perfect waterproofing, uh, et cetera. The best results, he says, at minimum cost. Bossom goes on to, to point out sort of three techniques or uh, three ideas that are inherent to prefabrication that can assist in making design a, a much speedier process, design and construction a much speedier process, uh, saving money at the same time and also producing a better product. He says, first, architects have to understand that we're now gonna build modular buildings, that we're gonna have all of these factories producing th their various things, cladding panels, toilets, uh, floor uh, materials, but we're going to pick one or two dimensions and everyone is going to produce to those dimensions so that when we're designing, we can sort of mix and match, right? We can <clears throat> use the, the, the standard modular grid and we know that if we've got a, a grid that we're working to, the factories are working to the same grid, we can always plug in whatever we need and, and, be, and rely on the fact that the material when it shows up on the site is going to fit those uh, dimensions. Related to this, he says, is standardization. So factories are going to churn out the same thing over and over. When we specify a door or specify a window, we're going to know exactly what we're getting. He doesn't say so here so much. Obviously, it's, it's cheaper and easier for the factory to produce the same thing over and over. Um, but it's also possible that other factories can produce the same window, right? We don't have to rely on one specific manufacturer's particular details. We know that no matter where the, which factory the window is coming from, which company the window is coming from, it's going to fit. This uh, increases competition, but it also leads to a, a more robust supply chain. We can get our windows uh, from multiple sources. 
the real advantage to the contractor, he says, is scheduling, that you know in advance how long things are going to take, you know where the materials are coming from, you know that they'll be readily available, and this lets you schedule the various trades that you need. People who are going to dig the foundations, people who are going to build maybe the, the, um, the, the, the first floor walls out of brick, people who are going to pour the concrete, people who are going to uh, assemble uh, timber framing. It says all of these know exactly when they're going to start and finish. The schedule gets more reliable because things are being taken off the shelf uh, instead of produced uh, to, to custom specifications. So the sequence is clearer. You may recall that we looked at some of the, the first uh, scheduling uh, efforts when we looked at, say, the Empire State Building. Well, this can now get kind of amped up that you can schedule to a much more to much more precision, much more reliability, knowing when things are going to show up on the job site, knowing exactly how long it's going to take uh, to put things together. <clears throat> There are industries by the 20th century that have already done this uh, to a large extent. Steel is a great example of this. In the 1880s, uh, even uh, in early 1890s, the Carnegie Corp Corporation realizes that steel could have a great advantage over cast and wrought iron if they standardized production. So when you're designing in cast iron or wrought iron uh, up until the 1880s, you go to your iron manufacturer and you say, I have this design for a column or I have this design for a, <clears throat> for a beam. Can you go ahead and manufacture that? And the cast or wrought iron manufacturers put it into their schedule and you get it whenever they're kind of ready. What Carnegie does is they standardize all of their shapes and they produce these catalogs, what are called pocket companions. And they say, basically, these are the shapes that we have in stock all the time. Uh, anytime you need a B11 beam, we know that it's in the warehouse, right? You can, you can use that. They also produce a lot of information about how those shapes are going to perform. So these pocket companions not only give you all the dimensions of their B11 beam, they also tell you how much safe load that beam can carry over what spans. So it's very easy to engineer. It's very easy to design to. You have, you, you know the performance you know the dimensions, it's easy to build with because you know that that particular beam is gonna be available. So Carnegie kind of does all of the things that Boston is talking about in the 50s, but they do it in the 1890s. They standardize, they modularize, uh, and um, they, uh, they, they, they mass produce. They also standardize the recipe that goes into the steel. So you know reliably that you're getting the same performance, the same material, no matter when you get it or no matter which foundry uh, it comes from. And this really inspires the whole industry. By the 1920s, the American Institute of Steel Construction has kind of taken over from Carnegie and the other manufacturers. And no matter what uh, uh, steel producer you go to, whether it's Carnegie or Inland or U.S. Steel, you get exactly the same shapes, you get exactly the same formula. The AISC steel handbook tells you what the shape is gonna be no matter what manufacturer you get it from. And if you designate, say, A36 steel, you know exactly how that steel is gonna perform because every manufacturer has put the same recipe uh, into it. This uh, gives the steel industry a huge advantage over its rivals, concrete uh, and, and, and other materials. And we see the steel industry sort of coming together and coming up with new alloys, again, standardized across the industry. So Core 10, for example, and stainless, which solves some of steel's uh, weathering problems, but also new forms. Whenever one manufacturer comes up with, say, a, a new shape for a joist, that spreads throughout the industry and becomes standardized throughout the industry. We get wide flange sections, which allow for easier riveting uh, or later bolting. We get open web trusses, uh, that as we'll see, allow for great flexibility in mechanical layouts. The steel industry basically makes it easy for architects, engineers, and builders by producing standardized dimensions with predictable performance and reliable availability. When you look at a steel job site in the post-war era, you're basically looking at a kit of parts. None of the steel is custom made. A lot of it is custom fabricated. So here, for example, on the left, you can see standard beam sections where in the shop they've cut holes to allow the, um, the mechanical systems to go through. 
those cuts are custom done, but they're done in a fabrication shop, right? Not in the foundry. So it's easier to schedule fabrication than it is actual production of steel. Those beams have been sitting in a warehouse for quite some time. They get delivered to the fabrication shop, cut very precisely and reliably because it's in factory conditions. They show up on the job site and everything is, is where it, it should be. A uh, steel construction site in the 50s looks very much in a lot of ways like an assembly line with standardized elements showing up, the same kind of repetitive tasks about bolting these together. Uh, and the, the speed of steel construction is a, another thing that allows it to, for a while, overtake concrete uh, in, in, in terms of commercial construction uh, anyway. Steel construction, therefore, is one of the first of what we might call building systems where all of the production, all of the dimensions, all of the modules are sort of standardized. There's a lot of room for variation uh, in a typical steel building, but we see also a lot of systems where that, I, that, that the idea of, uh, of modularization, standardization sort of gets out of the, the box and takes over the whole building project. Systems building is one of the ways that uh, organizations or governments work to match industrial production with social needs. And in Europe, particularly in Great Britain, we see this pursued with, with an awful lot of, uh, of energy. These are exercises in what we might call extreme standardization. So it's not just the steel shapes that you go and get off the rack, but it's literally everything. The air conditioners, the windows, the doors. Everything is prefabricated, everything is standardized, everything is modularized. And instead of sort of detailing uh, custom uh, elements, you're literally going to a catalog and, and, and picking them out for inclusion uh, in, in, in your project. The most dramatic example of this is probably the CLASP system, uh, which is a, a project taken on by the, the British government, particularly the Ministry of Education, as a way to try to meet the growing need for schools uh, in Great Britain. These are pages from the, the, the bulletin that sort of is the instruction manual for the CLASP system. And what the government does is they say, look, we're going to go to all of the, the building uh, material industries. So steel, absolutely, but also timber, uh, also uh, bricklayers. <clears throat> and we're going to standardize some dimensions. And we're going to say that if you produce your material to these dimensions, we can guarantee that there will be projects that will put them to use, right? We'll guarantee you the market because we're also going to our architects and we're going to our builders and we're telling them that when you design a school, you're going to do it to these modules and we're going to give you a catalog basically with the kit of parts that the schools are going to be made out of. So on the right, you see the, the basics kind of standardized dimensions. It's a three foot, four inch uh, module in plan and then a two foot module in section. You can see that floor heights are standardized. So the first floor is a 10 foot floor to ceiling with a two foot uh, deep uh, 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 floor sandwich. Upper floors are eight feet uh, floor height, floor to ceiling height with a two foot floor sandwich. So everything gets standardized. You see a little bit of the kind of kit of parts on the left, and then also showing how these kits of parts can be mixed and matched to create a little bit anyway of, of architectural variety. Prototype plan here that shows how this three foot four module can be moved around to create not only classrooms, but also assembly spaces, kitchens, offices, um, all the, the, the programmatic elements that go into a school can be based on this fundamental module. On the right, you see that they're not only talking about steel, but they're also talking about timber. So standard timber sizes cut into standard lengths connections between timber and steel or between timber and timber that are also standardized. So you know that you can get the same size strap from multiple manufacturers, guaranteeing the, the, the kind of supply chain. And then here on the left, you can see that the construction site is really more of an assembly site. It's what we call dry construction, usually instead of wet construction. If there are bricks like there are on the exterior wall of the school on the right, those are very often in prefabricated panels that are trucked to the site and simply bolted onto the, to the steel frame. The bricklayers lay the brick in factory conditions, so they're not slowed down by weather. They have uh, a level of precision that's much greater if they're laying the brick indoors than outdoors. Uh, and they can again telescope that so that they're doing the, the long, slow work of laying the bricks 
while, say, the foundations are being put together uh, on site. It's also isolating skilled labor and unskilled labor. So a lot of the work that goes on on the job site can be more or less unskilled. You're bolting pieces together uh, instead of laying brick or cutting stonework. All of the skilled labor, for the most part, happens within a shop, within controlled conditions. It's safer, you can take your time, you can get a, a better result. You can see on the right, too, that uh, even though there's a, a fair amount of repetition, that architects are able to play around a little bit, right? There is some room for uh, architectural expression. And you can see that the Ministry of Education does a, a reasonable job of adding things like artwork uh, to, to the program so that the, the schools don't end up looking completely like, uh, like factories. The United States faces some of the same issues, not uh, on anywhere near the, the sort of severity that Great Britain does. Um, but in California in particular, where there's a huge demographic boom in the 1960s, a similar project called SCSD gets put together to try again to standardize construction to produce schools using off-the-shelf components, right, as a way to speed construction, to make it cheaper, but also to make it more reliable in terms of the, the supply chain. This is from the SCSD manual, and you can see that there's a very similar approach to standardizing uh, modules. Using those modules then uh, five feet by five feet in plan, but two feet again in section, showing how those modules can be arranged in different ways to create the variety of rooms uh, that a school needs. When you zoom in, SCSD says the same thing as CLASP, that we will go to industry and make sure that open web joists, steel shapes, uh, uh, tim timber pieces, uh, precast concrete, all of these are getting made to these modules so that the architect can simply go through and specify which pieces they need. The engineer knows exactly how much load each one of those can take. The contractor knows exactly where they can go to get these uh, pieces, and they know that they will be ready, right? They'll be in the warehouse, uh, ready to go to the job site at a moment's notice. Contractor can also have a sort of skeleton crew on the site. All they're doing is bolting these finished pieces together, right? They're not doing any of the sort of plaster work or brick work uh, that, that we associate with, with long, long scheduling delays uh, in traditional construction. SCSD also does a really good job of taking Bantam's idea of the, of the power membrane and applying it to the, the systems uh, that they're using to, to construct these. So here on the right, this is a model looking up at the, the ceiling, the power membrane ceiling uh, of a typical school. And you can see that all of the ductwork and things that we've talked about uh, in the last uh, uh, lecture are there. And they're using the porosity of these mass-produced open web joists to allow the ducts to go exactly where they need to go. On the left, you see a typical module that incorporates not only ductwork, but also plumbing, electricity, and maybe most importantly, lighting. Uh, the, the lighting uh, module there is gonna produce the same level of light for classrooms no matter uh, where you are. The ductwork can be moved around or you can add or subtract registers so that the floor plan can be flexible. And you see an awful lot of emphasis on making sure that the school can evolve. So as the demography of the surrounding town changes, the school can expand or maybe even contract depending. Flexible partitions are built in so that classrooms can open and close onto one another. And you can see that the modularity of the structure allows the ductwork to go absolutely anywhere. So you can move the ductwork around if you need to. The lighting is always there. No matter where the walls are, you're gonna have adequate uh, lighting in, in your classrooms. Interestingly enough, this is a, a, in an era where there's research that starts being concerned with energy consumption, mostly for cost reasons, not yet for sustainability reasons. Uh, but a lot of these buildings are built, these school buildings are built without windows or with minimal windows. Uh, an idea again, going back to the kind of windowless buildings of the 30s, where all of the, the uh, kind of environmental needs of the kids in the school are being taken care of mechanically. The lighting is being handled by uh, electricity, heating and cooling, ventilation is being handled by uh, mechanical systems. The window is a kind of anachronism in a way, or an expensive anachronism uh, at least. A lot of these buildings haven't maybe aged particularly well. We look at them and, and sort of bemoan the lack of uh, windows. Uh, to a lot of us, uh, they, they seem a little bit stultifying in, in the, the, the massive repetition that they have. 
But both SCSD and CLASP uh, are, are kind of useful and productive, and I would argue kind of largely successful experiments in understanding where there is capacity uh, in industry and how to bring that capacity to address some of the really, really pressing issues uh, of the post-war era. In these two cases, school construction, we'll see examples in the next piece of the lecture where this capacity gets put to use for residential construction. Largely, in some cases, single family housing. This is the, the, the way we, we, we kind of do things uh, in much of the United States but also increasingly in addressing the problem of public housing, right? How do we uh, provide affordable residences, not only for people in the middle class, uh, but for people who maybe can't uh, afford uh, detached homes? In that next phase, uh, we'll look at some of the same materials, we'll look at some of the same processes, we'll look at even some of the same places, but we'll see how architects and designers in particular see not only a, a kind of solution to a pragmatic set of problems, but also new opportunities for aesthetic innovation as well.